Before we begin, please feel free to drop a like and subscribe for more scary content. Now let's get into the stories. Amnesia. Growing up I saw things. My mom pushed it off as it was just imaginary friends, like all parents do. But after a while she started realizing it wasn't that. I had turned nine and I had an agonizing fear of things following me and seeing things everywhere. My mother started taking me to church but sadly that didn't help. After a while I stopped talking to her about it, I just didn't want to bother her about it. I grew in agony as these things kept bugging me. Fast forward four years later when one day a new one appeared. A lady with long black hair, dressed in white, skinny as all get out. I never saw her real face since it was always covered by her hair but she seemed like one of the nicer hallucinations I had. The lady just sort of followed me in the waking and dream worlds. In my dreams I'd forget what we'd do, but I knew she was there. After a while I started calling her amnesia. That's just how I referred to her. I never really thought anything about it until one day in May in 2016. I was 15 then. I had come back home from a band concert and everyone in my family was outside along with the other people who were staying with us. Smoke was coming out of the house and all the lights were off. I ran out of the car and asked what was happening. They explained that our two dogs were barking at something in the hallway. Heaven, a girl staying with us at the time, had went to go see what was happening. In our hallway stood an eight-foot-tall shadowy male figure. She had screamed and got everyone. Her stepdad started smudging and blessing the house. While I was outside, I stared talking to one of Heaven's sisters about the figure. I explained that I had a hallucination that fit the description. I called him Dream Taker. After I had said that Heaven's sister had me tell my mom everything. About my dreams, my hallucinations, everything. When I told her about amnesia, all the color in her face went cold. She told me that. After I was born, she had taken me home to our apartment at the time. One day, she had put me in my crib and then went to go lay down for a bit. Just to be clear, my mother's bedroom was just across the way from mine, and she could see my crib from her bed. She had fallen asleep for a while when she was suddenly awoken to what sounded like someone walking in the hallway towards her room. Her blood ran cold. All she could do was look in horror. There in the hallway was a pale skinny lady. She had charcoal black hair that was a tangled drape over her face. She slumped over while walking as her white tattered dress dragged behind her. She started walking into my room and my mother immediately started to get up, but she couldn't. She felt as if an invisible force was binding her to the bed. The lady stopped and turned to look at my mother. Her hair swept from her face to reveal a face my mother could only describe as terrifying. She had no eyes. They were black voids that seemed to pierce through my mother's eyes. Her jaw seemed broken and hung open and a reddish black ooze dripped from it. The lady let out a high-pitched screech and I started to cry in my crib. The lady turned back around to my crib. She struggled as she listened to my screaming. Then I stopped. Everything was silent. Her thoughts ran through her mind. She couldn't think right. After a while, she could finally get up. She ran into my room to check on me. I was sound asleep like nothing had happened. She grabbed a bat and searched the apartment to find nothing. Everything was the same as it was. She grabbed our phone and called our neighbor. Hey, did you hear my baby cry? She was just H crying a little bit ago. What are you talking about? Your baby wasn't crying. Is everything okay? I didn't know what to think. Was this lady a blessing or a curse? My mother also told me my grandma dwelled in black magic and it could be a byproduct of something gone wrong. But who knows, honestly. I don't know how I feel about it, honestly. I was a highway patrolman for 20 years. This is one of my worst experiences. I was a highway patrolman for 20 years and I've seen it all. High-speed chases, gunfights, near-death encounters. But nothing, nothing compares to what happened in the summer of 2018. It was the graveyard shift. The stillness of the night had a way of amplifying every sound, every shadow. Most nights were the usual mix of speeding drivers and DUI stops. That night started no differently. I was stationed at my usual spot near mile marker 62, radar gun in hand, coffee thermos perched on the dash. The radio buzzed with routine chatter. Then, just as I was finishing my second cup of coffee, the radio chatted in. Any available units near Route 18, we have a 1090. I was confused. I'd never heard that code before. HQ, this is Unit 504. What's a 1090? Silence. HQ? No response. Just static. Seconds later, coordinates popped up on my patrol car's computer. It was an isolated patch off the highway, deep in the woods. Uneasy, I radioed my supervisor. 
Hey, Sarge, HQ just paged me about a 1090. What's the protocol? His response was curt. Ignore it. It wasn't meant for you. Seriously? They gave me coordinates. Drop it, 504. Get back to work. I hesitated, but orders were orders. The night dragged on with routine stops. Around 3 a.m., exhaustion hit, so I pulled into a donut shop. Yeah, I know the stereotype, but sometimes you just need the sugar rush. The shop was a dive, peeling paint, flickering neon sign, but it was open. Behind the counter stood a man so pale he looked like he'd been carved from marble. His fingers were unnaturally long, and he moved with a stiffness that gave me the creeps. What'll it be? His voice was raspy, like dead leaves rustling. Just coffee. And a couple of glazed. He slid my order across the counter without a word. His gaze lingered on me, unblinking, as if he were memorizing my face. Long night? He asked, his lips curling into a faint, unnatural smile. Yeah, graveyard shift. Never gets easier. He chuckled, a low, guttural sound that made my skin crawl. Be careful out there. You never know what might be lurking. I left in a hurry, the bell above the door jangling behind me. I was halfway to my car when the radio crackled again. Help me. The voice was faint, distorted, but unmistakably human. I froze, my heart hammering. HQ, this is Unit 504. Did someone just broadcast a distress call? No response. I tried my supervisor. Nothing. Curiosity gnawed at me. Against my better judgment, I punched the coordinates into my GPS and set off. The drive took me 45 minutes deep into the highway forest. The road narrowed until it was barely more than a dirt path. My headlights cut through the thick darkness, revealing gnarled trees that seemed to close in around me. When the GPS announced I'd arrived, I was in the middle of nowhere. I stepped out of the car, gun holstered, flashlight in hand. The silence was unnatural, not a single insect, not even the rustle of leaves. I radioed again. HQ, this is 504, I'm at the coordinates. What's going on? Static. I took a step forward. The ground was hard beneath my boots, but I couldn't hear my own footsteps. The air felt heavy, oppressive. Then behind me a twig snapped. I spun around, flashlight beam slicing through the darkness. Nothing. Who's there? I called, unholstering my gun. The radio crackled to life again. Help me! The voice was deafening as if it were screaming directly into my skull. I dropped the radio, clutching my ears. Before I could react, a heavy blow struck the back of my head, and everything went black. I woke up tied to a tree. My hands and feet were bound with rough rope, my head throbbing. The air reeked of damp earth and something metallic. Blood, maybe. Three hooded figures stood before me, their faces obscured. They whispered among themselves, their voices low and guttural. One stepped forward. Why did you come here? I... I got a call. A distress call, I stammered. Why are you here? The figure repeated more forcefully. I was just doing my job. Look, killing me won't do you any good. My team knows I'm out here. They'll come looking. They whispered among themselves again. Then one of them nodded. Let him go, the leader said. Another figure stepped forward, cutting my bonds. My legs were weak, but I managed to stand. Take your gun. Leave. Do not come back. I didn't need to be told twice. I grabbed my weapon and stumbled back toward my car. My head swam and my limbs felt heavy like I'd been drugged. As I made my way down the path, figures began emerging from the shadows. Dozens of them their faces pale and featureless. Don't come back, they chanted in unison. Don't come back. I reached my car and sped out of there, not daring to look in the rearview mirror. The next morning I reported everything to my supervisor. He dismissed it as exhaustion-induced hallucinations and put me on paid leave. But I know what I saw. Even now, years later, I can't shake the feeling that they're still watching me. I kept one of my radios as a memento of my time on the force. Sometimes late at night, it crackles to life. Help me, the voice whispers, and sometimes it calls my name. Tonight I've made up my mind. I'm going back. I don't care what's waiting for me in those woods. I need answers. Wish me luck. I found a hidden door in my basement. I wish I had never opened it. I've lived in my house for five years. It's an old place, built in the early 1900s, with all the charm and creaks you'd expect from a century-old home. The basement has always freaked me out a bit. It's cold, damp, and smells faintly of mildew. But I'd never paid it much attention beyond the occasional trip to store boxes or grab tools. Until last week, I was moving some old furniture when I noticed a draft. At first, I thought it was just the basement being drafty as usual, but then I realized it was coming from behind one of the shelves. 
The air was colder, almost icy. Curious, I pulled the shelf away from the wall and that's when I saw it. A small wooden door, barely taller than a crawlspace hatch, covered in peeling paint. I stared at it for a long time. It wasn't on the house inspection report when I bought the place and I had never noticed it before. It had no handle, just a keyhole. I should have stopped there. I should have walked away, but I didn't. Instead, I grabbed my toolbox, picked the lock, thank you YouTube tutorials, and swung the door open. Behind it was a narrow stone staircase, spiraling down into darkness. The air that rushed out smelled wrong, damp, metallic, and faintly sweet, like rotting fruit. Against every ounce of better judgment, I grabbed a flashlight and started descending. The steps felt endless. The farther I went, the more the walls seemed to close in. When I finally reached the bottom, I found myself in a small, circular chamber made of smooth stone. In the center was a well. It looked ancient, the edges worn smooth as if by centuries of use. Here's where it gets weird. As I shined my flashlight around, I noticed something scratched into the walls. Words. Over and over, the same phrase. Do not look down. I backed away from the well, heart pounding. But then I heard it. A soft, wet sound, like something shifting in the water. My flashlight flickered, and in the brief darkness, I swear, I heard a whisper. Faint, like it was coming from miles below. Help me. I should have run. I should have bolted back up the stairs and sealed the door forever. But something about that voice, it didn't sound threatening. It sounded desperate. Against my better judgment, I leaned over the well and aimed my flashlight down. The beam barely reached the water. It was black and still, reflecting nothing. But as I stared, the surface began to ripple. Slowly, something started to rise. At first, I thought it was a person. A head, pale and smooth, breaking the surface. Then I saw the eyes, round, lidless, and too large for its face. Its mouth was wide, filled with needle-like teeth. And it was smiling. The whisper came again, louder this time. Help me. I don't remember running back up the stairs. I don't remember sealing the door or pushing the shelf back in place. But I must have because when I came to, I was sitting on my kitchen floor, shaking, the basement door locked tight. Since then, I have heard noises at night, soft scratching, like something trying to find its way out. Last night, I found muddy footprints leading from the basement door to my bed. I haven't been back down there. I don't think I ever will. But the scratches are getting louder, and I can't help but notice they're starting to sound like words. Help me. Demon in the stream. I, 23F, used to have a real addiction to watching content on streaming platforms. This was because it was semester break, and most of my friends from university had traveled overseas for their break. I could not afford that luxury of seeing the world. So instead, I would browse trending streams from the comfort of my small apartment. There was one night, however, I came across an unusual stream. The title read, Streaming for 10 Days Without Sleeping. Curious at how someone could physically do this, I started watching. The streamer, who had short brown hair with dark eyes, sat at his desk in what appeared to be his bedroom. He must have had a bad web camera as his footage was grainy. A slow hum could be heard in the background. The broadcast started a day ago, so the streamer was still quite engaged with the online chat. Hello everyone, for those who are just joining, as you can see from the title, I'm trying to stay awake for 10 days straight. Checking the viewer count, I saw there were only about 50 people watching the stream. I stuck around for a few minutes, then decided to watch something else. Later, I messaged my friend Rebecca about the stream. We both studied the same degree, psychology, and had just finished our first year. She, however, was back home with her family in the States. We talked about how it must be impossible to stay awake for 10 days straight. Two days later, and I had completely forgotten about the stream. It was only until I was on the Explore page again that I saw his stream. Again, I was curious, so I started watching. It was very different this time. Standing up with his head down, the streamer was getting gently pushed back and forward between two other people. I assumed this was to keep him from falling asleep. His body was limp and lifeless, like a puppet that was no longer being held up. They were whispering something, as if they didn't want the audience to hear what was being said. The usual hum was in the background, but this time there was a click, 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 then a pause, then the clicking would start again. Between the clicks and the streamer's body, motionless body being gently pushed back and forward, I decided to stop watching. Something didn't feel right. Three more days passed, and again, I found myself lying on my bed, looking for something to watch. I found the same stream this time, however, it was titled, Help Me, I've Streamed for Seven Days Straight. 
I clicked on the stream without thinking. This time, the streamer stood by himself, head bent forward, looking to the ground. He swayed slowly. There was no clicking, but I could hear the blowing of wind. Before I could leave, I received a message from Rebecca. I replied to what she had said, and I also mentioned how weird the stream was getting. She agreed it was weird, and after a bit of back and forth, she announced she would have to go to bed. I wished her good night. I clicked over back to the tab. The tap opened, and there I saw him. The streamer was at his desk again, but this time he was looking directly into the camera. His face was pale and his eyes were red. Two bags underlined his eyes. Slowly the corners of his lips raised into wide grin. Hello Jane, how are you? He croaked. This made no sense. How could he know? My username didn't have Jane in it. I paused. I didn't know what to do. Don't you want to chat? He whispered, still with that unsettling smile. How do you know who I am? I wrote in the chat box. His eyes flickered to the left, reading the message, then looked straight ahead. I think we just share a connection. There's something about you. Was anyone else seeing this? I looked over to the viewer count and only saw the number one. I'm going to call the police. Tell me why you know my name. Again, his eyes looked over to the left, then straight. I think you should come here so I can tell you more. It'll be easier. I'm never doing that. Suddenly, his eyes twitched. He still smiled. You don't have a choice. I closed the tab, horrified of what I had witnessed. It was a while before I could get to sleep that night. My brain was in overdrive. How did he know me? The rain gently landing on my window didn't help my uneasiness. It was a long time before I fell asleep. The next day, I was determined to go to the police and report him. But I needed more evidence. Maybe I could get a recording of him explaining how he got my name. That'll give the police more information to work with. With my laptop in hand, I moved to the dining room in my apartment. Opening the streaming platform, I searched for his stream intentionally for the first time. The title read, Help me, I've streamed for eight days straight. Taking a breath in, I opened the stream. He was at his desk still, looking at his second monitor. He immediately snapped to look straight at the camera, again with that horrible smile. Hello, Jane. My fingers wouldn't move. It was felt like he was looking straight through my soul. Finally, I typed in chat. How do you know me? Again, his eyes darted to the left, then looked straight at me. You know how to find out. Come here. He leaned closer to the monitor. This is it, final warning. Tell me what you know or I go to the police. I pretended to be brave. Suddenly, his smile vanished. You won't be able to. I had had enough. I closed my laptop in an instant, only to reveal the same face looking at me in my dining room. This time, he was smiling again. The empty bar stool. Every night, Natalie walked into the dimly lit bar on the corner of her small town, her heels clicking against the worn wooden floors. Everyone knew her. She was the golden girl, highly respected in the community, the county commissioner who always got things done. People admired her sharp wit and warm smile, the way she lit up a room just by entering it. But what they noticed most was that Natalie always sat with Trent. Trent was someone she had known since middle school. They weren't close back then, but in recent years they seemed inseparable at the bar. He had aged well, with sharp cheekbones and piercing eyes that seemed to follow her every move. His sarcastic humor was the perfect foil to her effervescent charm. People assumed they were a couple. After all, they always sat together, always shared drinks, always laughed like old friends. But Natalie insisted they weren't. We never came here together, she'd tell anyone who asked. We just end up here at the same time, and they never left together either. Natalie always drove her own car, and Trent would slip out into the night before she could catch where he was going. Still, there was an unspoken understanding between them, a kind of gravity that pulled them back to that same bar stool night after night. Sometimes Natalie basked in the attention she got from others. Men, drawn by her charisma, would strike up conversations with her, offering to buy her drinks or telling her how impressed they were with her work. But whenever Natalie laughed a little too hard or leaned in a little too close, Trent would grow quiet. He'd tap his glass against the bar, louder than necessary, or mutter something under his breath. Once, he even barked out a sharp, sarcastic laugh that made the man she was talking to excuse himself awkwardly. Cut it out, Trent, she hissed, turning to him. I'm just being friendly. You sure about that? He snapped, his eyes darkening. 
You're acting like you don't know how this looks. I like the attention, she said, crossing her arms. Why does it matter to you anyway? You're not my boyfriend. Trent glared at her, his jaw tight, but said nothing more. The tension between them always dissipated by the next evening, though. No matter what, they'd find their way back to those same seats, sipping whiskey and sharing old memories of simpler times. But something about Trent's jealousy unnerved Natalie. She chalked it up to his protectiveness or maybe his own unspoken feelings for her. She even felt guilty for enjoying the flirtations of others, knowing how it must sting him. Yet she couldn't shake the growing unease whenever he sulked beside her. One night, after a particularly long commission meeting, Natalie arrived later than usual. The bar was unusually quiet. The regulars waved as she entered, but her usual seat next to Trent was empty. She glanced around, expecting him to show up any minute. He always did. Trent not here yet. She asked the bartender, Greg, as he slid her drink across the counter. Greg gave her a strange look. Natalie, Trent hasn't been here for years. She blinked, confused. What are you talking about? He's here every night. We always sit together. Greg frowned, leaning in closer. Natalie, Trent died, remember? It was that car accident. What, ten years ago? He left before you one night and hasn't been back since. You spoke at his funeral. Her heart raced, the words slamming into her like a freight train. No, that's, that's not true. He's here. He's always here. Greg's face softened. You've been sitting alone, Nat, always talking to an empty seat. We just figured it was your way of coping. Natalie felt the room spin, her mind racing through every conversation, every laugh, every jealous remark. The memories played back differently now. The empty chair. The way no one else ever acknowledged him. The way the bartender never poured him a drink. Her hands trembled as she looked at the seat beside her. For the first time, she noticed how perfectly untouched it was. No glass, no coat draped over the back, no sign of life, just emptiness. Tears filled her eyes as the realization hit her like a thunderbolt. Trent had never been there, not since the accident. She'd clung to him, her mind conjuring his presence to fill the void he'd left behind. Suddenly, the air seemed colder. The faint sound of a laugh, his laugh, echoed in her ears. She turned, expecting to see him, but there was only the empty bar stool. I'm sorry, she whispered, her voice breaking. I didn't know how to let you go. And for the first time in years, she left the bar without waiting for Trent. She stepped into the cold night, alone, ready to face the ghosts within her. Voices from the basement. The house loomed over them like a sentinel of time, its weathered siding peeling away as if trying to shed decades of memories. Sarah stood in the driveway, arms crossed, staring at the place she'd spent countless summer afternoons as a child. But today, the warmth she once associated with her grandmother's house felt suffocating, replaced by a heavy silence that pressed against her chest. Still can't believe she's gone, she murmured more to herself than to the others. Jack, tall and wiry with a perpetual smirk that masked his nervous energy, stepped beside her. Yeah, she was tough as nails. Thought she'd outlive all of us. Mia, Sarah's best friend since middle school, placed a comforting hand on her shoulder. Her presence had always been calming, with her soft voice and empathetic gaze. We'll help you get through this, she said. Cole, the group's resident jokester, leaned against his beat-up truck, flicking a lighter open and shut in rapid succession. Cleaning out an old lady's house. Not exactly how I wanted to spend my weekend, he quipped, though his tone lacked its usual bite. Hey! Rebecca snapped, glaring at him. Her sharp tongue and no-nonsense demeanor often kept the group in line. Show some respect. Sarah managed a weak smile. Thanks for being here, guys. It's just, there's a lot of stuff and mom can't handle it alone. Her mother had been inconsolable since the funeral, leaving Sarah to shoulder the responsibility of clearing out the house. They entered through the back door, which creaked on its rusted hinges. The scent of mothballs and dust filled the air, mixed with something faintly sweet, like lilacs. Sarah's grandmother had loved lilacs. The kitchen looked frozen in time, its yellowed wallpaper peeling at the edges. Sarah paused by the table, running her fingers over the grooves in the wood where her grandmother's sewing machine had once sat. I thought this would feel nostalgic, she said, but it just feels empty. Jack clapped her on the back, perhaps a little too hard. Then let's make it less empty. Where do we start? Sarah led them to the basement door. Mom said most of the stuff is down here. Rebecca wrinkled her nose. Basements are always creepy. Why couldn't your grandma hoard stuff in the attic like normal old people? 
Nicole smirked. Maybe she kept her zombie army down there. Not funny, Sarah said, rolling her eyes. She flipped the light switch, but nothing happened. Great, bulbs out. Jack pulled out his phone and turned on the flashlight. Lead the way, fearless leader. The wooden stairs groaned under their weight as they descended. The basement smelled even mustier than the rest of the house, with a damp chill that made Sarah shiver. Shelves lined the walls crammed with old mason jars, books, and boxes labeled in her grandmother's meticulous handwriting. They worked in relative silence for a while, shifting boxes and sorting through items to keep, donate, or toss. It was Jack who found it. Hey, check this out. His voice echoed in the stillness. Sarah turned to see him holding a wooden box. The edges were blackened as if it had been burned, and strange symbols were carved into the lid. He flipped the latch and opened it to reveal the Ouija board inside, the letters and numbers etched deeply into the wood. Nope, Mia said immediately, backing away. Oh, come on, Cole said, grinning. What's the worst that could happen? Sarah hesitated, memories flooding back. Her grandmother had been deeply superstitious, always warning her to never mess with things she didn't understand. But curiosity flickered in her chest, outweighing her caution. It's just a game, Jack said, already setting the board on an old card table. Sarah bit her lip. Fine, but just for a minute. Then we get back to work. The group gathered hesitantly around the table, the dim light from their phones casting long, flickering shadows across the room. Sarah stared at the board as if it might bite. The letters and numbers gleamed unnaturally, despite the layer of grime that coated the wood. She ran her fingers along the edges, feeling the intricate carvings. This thing is ancient, Mia said, her voice a whisper. Like museum piece ancient, or cursed, Rebecca muttered, arms crossed tightly over her chest. Jack raised an eyebrow. You're not scared, are you? Rebecca shot him a glare. I'm not scared. I'm smart. There's a difference. All right, enough, Sarah said, her tone sharper than she intended. Her nerves were fraying. It's just a piece of wood. Cole leaned closer, inspecting the symbols burned into the corners. What's with these marks? They look weird. Probably decorative, Jack said, though his voice carried a hint of unease. Rebecca shook her head. Those are runes. My grandma used to have books on stuff like this. They're supposed to, I don't know, ward off evil or something. Great, Mia whispered. So why are they on a Ouija board? Doesn't that contradict the point? The room seemed to grow colder, a draft snaking through the basement despite the lack of windows. Sarah shivered, pulling her hoodie tighter around herself. All right, now I'm curious, Jack said, breaking the silence. He pulled the planchette from the box, its triangular shape smooth and polished, with a small glass window in the center. He held it up to the light. Who's in? No way, Mia said, stepping back. Those things freak me out. You've seen the movies. Movies aren't real, Mia, Jack said, setting the planchette on the board with a casual confidence that felt forced. Sarah hesitated. A knot of unease twisted in her stomach, but something about the board drew her in. A quiet voice in the back of her mind, one she refused to acknowledge as her grandmother's, whispered a warning. We don't have to do this, Rebecca said. Sarah nodded, but surprised herself by sitting down at the table. Let's just see what happens. Jack grinned and took a seat beside her. That's the spirit, no pun intended. Cole dropped into a chair across from them. This is gonna be awesome. Rebecca groaned, but pulled up a chair, her expression a mixture of reluctance and curiosity. Fine, but if something starts whispering in Latin, I'm out. They all placed their fingers lightly on the planchette. Sarah's heart thudded in her chest as the room seemed to hold its breath. Okay, Jack said, his voice steady but softer than usual. Is anyone there? The planchette didn't move. The silence in the basement deepened, pressing against their ears. Maybe we're not asking the right questions, Cole said, his tone half-joking. What if we ask for a sign? Mia, standing a few feet away, crossed her arms tightly. You shouldn't do that. Why not? Jack asked. Because... Inviting something to give you a sign feels reckless, she said, her voice trembling slightly. Jack smirked, but didn't press further. Fine, let's keep it simple. Who are you? For a moment, nothing happened. Then slowly, the planchette began to move. Sarah froze, her breath caught in her throat. Okay, who's doing that? Not me, Cole said, his voice oddly flat. I swear I'm not, Jack added, though his usual cockiness was gone. The planchette stopped, resting on the letter H. 
It slid again, stopping on E, then L, and finally P. Help? Sarah whispered. The light on Jack's phone flickered and dimmed. The shadows in the corners of the basement seemed to stretch and twist, creeping closer. I'm done, Mia said, backing toward the stairs. Before anyone could respond, the planchette jerked violently, spinning across the board before stopping dead center. The carved runes around the edges seemed to glow faintly, as if the board itself were alive. The basement door slammed shut, the sound echoing like a gunshot. Did you see that? Rebecca whispered, her voice barely audible over the sudden pounding of Sarah's heartbeat. Of course we saw it, Cole hissed, pushing back his chair so abruptly it scraped against the concrete floor. His bravado was gone, replaced with wide eyes darting toward the sealed door. It's just the wind, Jack said, but his voice wavered. He tugged at the door handle, yanking it harder with every attempt. It's stuck. There are no windows down here. Mia snapped from the shadows. She was pressing herself against the far wall, her flashlight shaking in her hand. How could it be the wind? Sarah felt her breath hitch as a low creak echoed from somewhere deep within the basement. It wasn't the groan of settling wood or the hum of old pipes. It was deliberate, rhythmic, like the sound of something heavy dragging across the floor, closer than stopping. Who's there? Sarah asked before she could stop herself, her voice trembling. The planchette, untouched, jerked violently across the board. It spelled run. What the hell? Rebecca whispered, her knuckles white as she gripped the edge of the table. I'm done, Cole said, backing toward the stairs. This isn't funny anymore. No one's laughing, Mia said, clutching her phone like a lifeline. The dragging noise started again, louder this time, accompanied by the faint sound of whispering. It came from every corner, bouncing off the walls in a language none of them could understand. Turn on more lights, Jack said, his voice cracking. There aren't any. Sarah snapped, fumbling for her phone. Her flashlight beam wavered, catching glimpses of the basement. The dust-covered shelves, the broken jars, the Ouija board glowing faintly on the table. And then, something else. In the farthest corner, the shadows seemed to shift unnaturally, pooling together like ink spilling across a page. For a moment, Sarah thought she saw the outline of a figure. Too tall, its limbs unnaturally long and spindly, its head cocked at an impossible angle. There's something there, Sarah breathed. Shut up, Cole hissed, pulling at the door again. Look, she insisted, her flashlight trembling as she aimed it toward the corner. But the beam revealed nothing, just cobwebs and dusty concrete. Jack turned back to the board. This has to be a prank. It has to be... The planchette slammed against the table, cracking the wood. The lights on their phones flickered in unison, plunging them into brief but total darkness. When the lights stabilized, the board was different. The letters and numbers were gone, replaced with symbols none of them recognized. The runes carved into the edges pulsed like a heartbeat, faintly glowing red. Put it back in the box, Rebecca said, her voice rising with panic. Yeah, no kidding, Jack said, scooping up the pieces with trembling hands. But when he tried to close the lid, it wouldn't shut. I think it's too late for that, Mia whispered. Her gaze locked on the shadows pooling behind Sarah. Sarah turned slowly, dread coiling in her stomach. The figure was back, closer now, its head tilting back and forth as if trying to understand her. And then it smiled. It didn't have a face, just a hollow void where one should be. But somehow Sarah knew it was smiling. The whispering grew louder, piercing their ears. Words became clearer, though distorted, like a broken record spinning too fast. Stay, stay, stay. Jack stumbled backward, knocking over a stack of boxes. Screw this! We're leaving! No, Sarah yelled, grabbing his arm. We can't just run. What if it... The lights flickered again, and this time they didn't come back on. Total darkness swallowed them. And then the screaming started. The basement's oppressive darkness consumed everything, a void so complete it seemed to swallow their screams. The group became separated in the confusion, their panicked voices echoing off the concrete walls like distant cries in a cavern. Sarah's heart thundered in her chest as she fumbled through the darkness, her hands scraping against rough concrete. Jack? Mia? Someone say something! She yelled, her voice cracking. But no one answered. Instead, a faint, guttural sound drifted through the air, a wet, labored breathing that wasn't hers. She spun, her flashlight beam dancing wildly, 
but the light seemed swallowed by the dark. Then, from the edge of her vision, she saw it. The figure from before, impossibly tall and crooked, standing just a few feet away. Get away! She screamed, backing into a stack of boxes that toppled around her. But the figure didn't move. Its hollow void of a face tilted, curious, as if studying her. Sarah stumbled to her feet, clutching a broken piece of wood like a weapon. The figure's smile grew wider, stretching into the dark, the outline of its teeth razor-sharp and impossibly white. And then it lunged. Jack's head throbbed where he'd hit it in the chaos, and his flashlight had shattered on the floor. Crawling on his hands and knees, he groped through the darkness, calling out, Rebecca, Cole, where are you? The basement answered with a long, low moan, like metal twisting under strain. A cold hand brushed against his arm. Jack froze, his breath catching in his throat. Rebecca? He whispered, reaching out. But what his fingers touched was wrong, slick and icy like wet clay. The hand wrapped around his wrist, pulling him with inhuman strength. Jack screamed, digging his heels into the concrete as he was dragged backward. Behind him, a voice rasped, low and guttural. Come closer. I've been waiting. He turned, his eyes adjusting just enough to make out the thing gripping him. It wasn't human. Its skeletal body was wrapped in sagging, translucent skin, its hollow eyes boring into him. A jagged grin split its face as it whispered, Let me in. Jack clawed at the ground, his screams swallowed by the basement's endless void. Mia had bolted when the screaming started, her survival instincts overriding everything else. She found herself pressed against a cold wall, her flashlight flickering as she tried to steady her breathing. It's not real, she whispered to herself. This isn't real. But then she saw it, shadows slithering along the walls, pooling at her feet. They rose slowly, taking shape. A dozen faceless forms, their outlines shifting as if made of smoke. They whispered her name in unison, a thousand voices layered into one. Mia, Mia, come join us. No, she screamed, swiping at them with her flashlight. The beam cut through the shapes, but did nothing to stop them. One of the shadows reached out, its fingers stretching unnaturally long, curling around her neck. Her flashlight fell from her hand, and as the light rolled away, Mia saw her reflection in its glass lens. But it wasn't her. The face staring back at her was pale, her eyes sunken and empty. Her lips moved silently, mouthing the words, It's already too late. Rebecca crouched in the far corner of the basement, clutching her phone like a lifeline. Its dim light barely illuminated her shaking hands. She dialed 911 with trembling fingers, but the line was dead, just static on the other end. Please, she whispered, tears streaming down her face. Someone help us. From the static, a voice emerged. It was soft, melodic, and eerily familiar. Rebecca, why didn't you listen? Her phone screen flickered, and an image appeared. A live feed of herself, staring into the screen with wide, terrified eyes. Behind her, a shadow moved. Rebecca spun, dropping her phone. Her flashlight beam caught the briefest glimpse of a figure crawling toward her, its limbs bending at impossible angles, its head tilted sharply to one side. Stay back! She screamed, grabbing the nearest object, a rusty wrench, and swinging it wildly. The thing stopped, cocked its head, and let out a laugh that sounded like nails scraping on glass. The wrench flew from her hands as the creature lunged, pinning her against the wall. Its mouth opened impossibly wide, as if it would swallow her whole. Cole was running, though he wasn't sure where. The basement seemed endless, its walls stretching into infinity. He could hear the others screaming, but their voices were distorted, echoing like they were underwater. A light appeared ahead, a faint glow. Desperate, he sprinted toward it, thinking it might be an exit. But as Hay got closer, he saw it wasn't a door. It was a mirror. He skidded to a halt, staring at his own reflection. But the person in the mirror didn't move the way he did. Who are you? Cole whispered. The reflection grinned, its mouth splitting from ear to ear. I'm you, but better. Before Cole could react, the mirror shattered, and from the shards rose dozens of hands, clawing at him, dragging him into the glass. His screams were muffled as his reflection stood on the other side, smiling back at him. The darkness in the basement thickened, consuming the cries of the friends one by one. And then silence. The basement door creaked open, and the faint scent of lilacs wafted through the house. Upstairs, the Ouija board lay untouched on the kitchen table, its symbols burned into the wood. And in the basement, 
The whispering began again rising and falling like waves in the oppressive silence. The basement seemed alive, breathing, its shadows pulsing with a dark rhythm. Sarah's screams were the first to break the quiet, sharp and guttural. She staggered into the center of the room, her clothes torn and blood staining her arms. It's in my head, she cried, clutching at her temples. Her flashlight flickered weakly, casting distorted shapes on the walls. Sarah. Jack's voice trembled as he crawled out of the darkness. His face was pale, his hands trembling uncontrollably. What? What did it do to you? Sarah didn't answer. She stared at Jack, her eyes wide and unfocused, as if she wasn't seeing him at all. Rebecca stumbled into view next, her hair disheveled, her breathing ragged. She clutched her arm, a deep gash oozing blood. Where's Mia? And Cole? They're gone, Sarah whispered, her voice hollow. It took them. What do you mean, took them? Jack demanded, his voice rising. I saw it. Sarah snapped, her voice breaking. It dragged them into the shadows. I heard them screaming, and then... Nothing. Rebecca shook her head violently, tears streaming down her face. No, they're still here. We just have to... A low rumble interrupted her, the sound vibrating through the floor. The runes on the Ouija board began to glow again, brighter this time, casting an eerie red light that filled the room. Jack stepped closer, staring at the board. The symbols had shifted again, forming a single word. Choose. What does it mean? Rebecca whispered, her voice shaking. The basement answered with another rumble, and then a figure stepped forward from the shadows. It was Cole, or at least it looked like him. Cole! Rebecca shouted, rushing toward him. Stop! Sarah screamed, grabbing her arm. But it was too late. As Rebecca reached for Cole, his face twisted into something inhuman. His jaw unhinged, stretching impossibly wide, revealing rows of jagged teeth. His arms snapped backward, his fingers elongating into sharp claws. Rebecca's scream was cut short as the creature lunged, its claws raking across her chest. She fell to the floor, gasping as blood pooled around her. Jack grabbed a metal pipe from the ground and swung it wildly, connecting with the creature's side. It howled, retreating into the shadows, its form dissolving like smoke. We have to get out of here! Jack yelled, pulling Sarah to her feet. No, Sarah said, shaking her head. The board? It wants us to play. What are you talking about? Jack demanded. Choose, Sarah said, pointing to the glowing word. It's giving us a choice. One of us stays. Or we all die. Jack stared at her, his face pale. That's insane. The shadows around them began to shift, coalescing into figures that circled them like predators. Their whispers grew louder, their distorted voices chanting, Choose! 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 Sarah grabbed the board, her hands trembling. It's the only way, she said, tears streaming down her face. Sarah, no! Jack shouted, but she ignored him. She placed her hands on the planchette and it began to move, spelling out her name. No! Jack yelled, grabbing her arm. We'll find another way. There is no other way! Sarah screamed, pulling away. Don't you get it? This isn't a game. It never was. The shadows closed in, their whispers rising to a deafening roar. Sarah looked at Jack one last time, her eyes filled with tears. Take care of Rebecca, she whispered. Before Jack could stop her, Sarah pressed the planchette to the final rune. The shadow surged forward, enveloping her completely. Her scream echoed through the basement before fading into silence. The red light from the board dimmed and the oppressive atmosphere lifted. Jack and Rebecca stared at the spot where Sarah had been, her absence a gaping wound in the room. She's gone, Rebecca whispered, her voice barely audible. Jack nodded, his hands shaking. We need to leave now. Together they stumbled up the stairs, the basement door creaking open as if inviting them out. The house was eerily quiet, the scent of lilacs stronger than ever. As they stepped outside, the cold night air hit them like a wave. Rebecca collapsed onto the porch, sobbing uncontrollably. Jack stood beside her, staring back at the house. Do you think it's over? Rebecca asked, her voice trembling. Jack didn't answer. He couldn't. Inside the house, the basement door creaked shut, and in the silence that followed, the faint whispering began again. Jack couldn't shake the feeling that something was still watching them. The house stood silent behind them, a dark silhouette against the night sky, but its presence lingered, heavy and unyielding. Rebecca, we need to get to the car, Jack said, pulling her to her feet. His voice was firm, but his eyes darted nervously back toward the house. 
Rebecca wiped her tears, nodding weakly. They made their way toward the driveway, the crunch of gravel beneath their feet unnaturally loud in the quiet night. The car came into view, a welcome beacon of safety. Jack fumbled with the keys, his trembling hands struggling to fit them into the lock. Come on, come on, he muttered. A cold breeze swept past them, carrying the faint scent of lilacs. Rebecca froze, her eyes widening. Do you hear that? She whispered. Jack stopped, his blood running cold. The whispers were back, faint but unmistakable, drifting on the wind like a sinister lullaby. Jack, Rebecca, don't leave us. The car's headlights flickered on, casting long, distorted shadows across the driveway. Jack and Rebecca turned, their hearts pounding, as the shadows began to twist and writhe, forming grotesque shapes. We need to go, Jack shouted, yanking the door open and shoving Rebecca inside. He jumped into the driver's seat, starting the engine with shaking hands. The shadows pressed against the car windows, their forms shifting and clawing, faces appearing briefly before melting away. One of them, a tall, crooked figure, leaned close to Rebecca's window, its hollow eyes staring directly at her. Drive! Rebecca screamed, covering her face. Jack floored the gas pedal, the car lurching forward. The tires screeched as they sped down the driveway, the house shrinking in the rearview mirror. As they reached the main road, the oppressive feeling began to fade, but neither of them spoke. Jack kept glancing in the rearview mirror, half expecting to see the shadows chasing them. Rebecca stared out the window, her face pale and tear-streaked. Do you think Sarah's... Okay, she asked softly. Jack didn't answer. He couldn't. The road stretched endlessly before them, the car's headlights cutting through the dark. But then, just ahead, they saw something, a figure standing in the middle of the road. Jack slammed on the brakes, the car skidding to a halt. The figure didn't move. It's just a person, Jack said, trying to convince himself. The figure stepped into the light and their hearts sank. It was Sarah. Her clothes were torn, her face pale, and her eyes empty. She raised a hand, motioning for them to stop. Sarah! Rebecca yelled, throwing open her door. No, wait! Jack shouted, but Rebecca was already running toward her. As Rebecca reached Sarah, she stopped abruptly. Something was wrong. Sarah's lips curled into a smile, but it wasn't warm. It was jagged, too wide, splitting her face unnaturally. Rebecca! Sarah said, her voice a low, distorted growl. Why didn't you stay? Rebecca stumbled back, but it was too late. Sarah lunged forward, her hands clawing at Rebecca's throat. Jack's heart raced, his breath coming in ragged gasps as he lunged toward the creature that looked like Sarah. His hands were slick with sweat as he grabbed the tire iron from the back seat, its cold metal biting into his palm. The creature's smile stretched wider, its jaw cracking as if it were breaking apart. You can't leave, Jack. It growled, its voice guttural and unnatural, like gravel grinding against bone. It wasn't Sarah anymore. Her skin was too pale, too stretched, and her eyes, those hollow, empty sockets, were dark, pools of nothingness that seemed to devour the light. Her body twitched unnervingly, contorting like a broken marionette, limbs jerking in erratic, unnatural motions. Before Jack could react, the creature's long, gnarled hand shot out fingers elongating into sharp talons, slashing at him with a speed he couldn't predict. The claws raked across his chest, tearing through his shirt and leaving deep gouges in his skin. He howled, stumbling back, but the creature was faster. With a sickening crack, its neck twisted impossibly, like rubber bending in a direction no human body could. The creature's head jerked back and forth, its spine audibly cracking as it contorted itself into a grotesque parody of human movement. The skin along its neck stretched and pulled, the veins black and pulsating beneath the surface, as if they were trying to escape its body. Jack swung the tire iron with all his might, the heavy metal connecting with the creature's head with a wet, bone-shattering thud. The force of the blow sent the creature stumbling back, its body buckling unnaturally. Its skull cracked open with a sickening pop, a flood of dark, viscous liquid spilling from the wound, splattering across the ground. The thing shrieked. The sound like nails dragging across a chalkboard, its mouth stretching open to reveal rows of sharp, jagged teeth that weren't even remotely human. The skin around its mouth tore as it howled, revealing more of its true form, skin peeling back, sinew and muscle exposed in places it shouldn't have been. Its lips bled, but it didn't stop, didn't flinch. Its arm, now bent at an impossible angle, shot forward, the claws swiping across Jack's torso. He felt a searing pain as the talons tore through his flesh, 
dragging blood across his ribs. The creature hissed again, its body jerking like a marionette caught in a storm of unseen strings. The wound in its head, though deep and grotesque, seemed to heal instantly, skin knitting back together with a sickening, sticky noise. Jack gritted his teeth, his head swimming with pain. He swung again, this time at the creature's neck. The blow landed hard, but instead of severing its head, the creature's neck split open in a jagged, gory tear, like a bag of meat being ripped apart. Blood, or something darker, more viscous, poured from the wound, splattering across Jack's face and chest. The creature screeched louder, its sound reverberating through Jack's skull. Rebecca's gasps were like a distant echo as Jack fought, his hands slipping in the dark, sticky mess. The tire iron slipped from his grip, falling to the ground with a metallic clang, but the creature didn't stop. It lunged again, its twisted body moving faster than any human form should. Its claws gripped Jack's shoulder, digging in deep. He felt them tear through his skin like paper, blood pouring down his arm. With his free hand, Jack grabbed the creature's throat, squeezing, trying to choke the life out of it. But its skin was cold and rubbery, giving no purchase, no sign of weakening. In a final frantic effort, Jack reached for anything, anything that could end this. His hand brushed across the broken tire iron, now lying just a foot away. He grabbed it, his fingers slick with blood, and with one last desperate swing, he drove the metal into the creature's chest. The thing shuddered violently, its body spasming as the metal dug deep. Its ribcage cracked open, flesh tearing apart in a sickening, fleshy explosion. Dark blood splattering across the car and Jack. The creature's mouth opened wide in a final scream, but instead of air, it released a torrent of black, tar-like fluid, choking on it as its body started to collapse. Jack stumbled back, gasping for breath, Heishist heaving in agony. The creature's body dissolved like a nightmare unraveling. Its limbs twisted and broke apart, turning to ash before his eyes. The face that had once been Sarah's melted away, leaving nothing but the dark, empty void of its hollow eyes staring at him one last time. Rebecca was shaking violently, her face pale, blood still staining her clothes. What the hell was that? She whispered, her voice cracked. Jack couldn't answer. His whole body screamed in pain, his thoughts spinning in a haze. All he could do was stagger backward, dragging Rebecca with him toward the car. But as they got into the car, Jack glanced in the rearview mirror, his heart skipping a beat. The shadows had shifted again, and something, or someone, was still standing in the distance, watching. They drove in silence, the tension in the car unbearable. The road seemed endless, stretching into the night like a cruel joke. Rebecca stared at her reflection in the passenger window, her mind racing. But as she looked closer, her reflection didn't match her movements. Her reflection smiled. Jack, she whispered, her voice shaking. Jack glanced at her, his eyes wide. What is it? Before she could answer, the radio crackled to life, filling the car with static. A voice emerged, soft and melodic. You thought you could leave? The game isn't over. The car's headlights flickered and the engine sputtered. The shadows returned, slithering across the windows, enveloping the car in darkness. Jack and Rebecca screamed, but their voices were lost in the void. The house sat quiet and still, its basement door slightly ajar. Inside, the Ouija board lay untouched on the table. The faint sound of laughter echoed through the empty halls. My potential killer collapsed. This is from when I was 15, 2014. I used to live in Dallas, Texas, and I went to a pretty ordinary school. I remember, though, that when school ended near the wintertime, outside was really dark. I used to have to walk home from school, as my parents did not own a car and were in the process of getting a license. One random day, I remember walking out of school and heading for home without my friend. My friend usually walked home with me, but this was on a Tuesday, and on Tuesdays she had soccer practice after school. So I walked home alone that day in the dark. I remember passing a shop and seeing a boy, slightly older than me, standing near it, smoking. He was wearing a hood, but I could see his face and he was glaring at me, so I just looked away and kept walking. Then I started to hear his footsteps behind me and I started to panic. I wasn't sure of his motives and at one point, I remember I pretended to go on my phone just to make sure he was following me in its reflection. And he was. I was shit scared so I started sprinting. IDK, if that was the best thing to do in that situation, but I did it. I ran halfway to my house and then stopped because I was out of breath. I was also still aware of the boy physically jogging after me, 
and I got angry for some reason and decided to confront him. I figured he was only about a few years older than me, and so he couldn't be that harmful. Yes, I know, I was a stupid kid. I turned around to confront him, and I saw him standing there looking at me. Then suddenly he collapsed. His knees snapped the wrong way, and he fell to the ground into a puddle. It was raining at this point. I screamed, and I think I ran up to him because I thought he was hurt or something. But when I got closer, I realized his mouth was open. His eyes were wide open, and his hands were bent at odd angles around his head when he'd fell. He was also making a strange gasping choking noise, and he was holding a pocket knife. I was sure that if I stayed around longer I was dead, so I sprinted all the way back home. Since then I have not told anyone about this. I don't know if that boy randomly died that day because his death wasn't mentioned anywhere. I always feel guilty thinking I should have called the police, but I was just so shit scared. I never had that experience again, saw that boy again, or even heard about him again. I still think about him sometimes. What if I had ran too slow? The boy in the attic. It was just supposed to be a quick visit. We'd only been in the house for a few hours, and my parents were already making dinner, unpacking boxes, and adjusting to the new place. I was supposed to help, but all I wanted was to explore. The house was huge, far bigger than any place we'd lived before. Big enough that I had to find my own corners to escape to. The attic door was in the hallway, tucked at the very end near the stairs covered by a thick, old-fashioned carpet that almost made it blend into the walls. At first I hadn't thought much of it, just another door, but something about the darkness behind it drew me in. When I pushed it open, a rush of cold air hit me and I hesitated. The attic wasn't much, just some old trunks, piles of forgotten furniture, and boxes that looked like they'd been there for decades. The air smelled damp, a mix of dust and rot. But something else, something strange, lingered like the house itself had been holding its breath for years. I stepped inside. It felt off. Not in a way that made me scared, but in a way that made me aware. Like someone was watching me. I looked over my shoulder, but there was nothing there. But the feeling didn't go away. The floorboards creaked under my weight as I wandered further in, my flashlight beam cutting through the darkness. I moved past old furniture, chairs, shelves, a broken mirror. The reflective surface cracked like a spider's web, and I stumbled over a pile of dusty books. The light flickered above me and I froze, my heart skipping a beat. That's when I heard it. A soft sound. A scraping. Like someone was dragging something across the floor. At first I thought it was just the house settling, the old beams creaking, but no. It was something else. Something too deliberate. I turned slowly, scanning the attic. I felt cold all over, goosebumps rising on my arms. Then my flashlight landed on a dark corner at the far end of the room. I couldn't see much, just shadows, thick and oppressive. But then I saw it, a pair of eyes, a child's eyes. They were glowing faintly, but only just enough to catch my attention. They were wide, unblinking, watching me. And though I couldn't see much else of the child, just their eyes staring through the thick shadows, I knew they weren't supposed to be there. Not at all. I took a step back, my breath catching in my throat. My first instinct was to toggle out, but the air was thick in my chest. My voice felt trapped. I slowly reached for the attic door. That's when the boy moved. He slid out of the shadows, crawling on his hands and knees with a slow, deliberate pace, like he was approaching something carefully. His skin was pale, almost sickly, and his hair hung over his face in tangled strands. His clothes, ragged, too old, ripped at the edges. His eyes, they never left mine. Those hollow eyes wide with a kind of hunger I couldn't explain. Who are you? I asked, my voice barely a whisper. The boy didn't respond. He just continued crawling forward, his movements unnatural, jerking like something that wasn't entirely human. And then, in a voice that wasn't quite his, but somehow was, he whispered, You're not supposed to be here. I felt a chill race down my spine. My feet were rooted to the spot as I stared at him. His eyes... They were hollow, yes, but there was something else, something more alive behind them. Like they knew something I didn't. He came closer. Too close. I felt his presence now, like a weight on the air, suffocating me. His hands, pale and trembling, scraped against the floor with a sound that made my stomach lurch. The closer he came, the more I wanted to run, but my legs wouldn't move. My body wouldn't listen. He stopped just short of me, his face inches from mine, his breath ragged. And that's when I saw it. His mouth stretched wide, impossibly wide, like a grin. 
a grin that made my heart race. He whispered again, and this time his words sounded louder. More urgent. You should have stayed away. You shouldn't have come to the attic. The temperature in the room dropped even further, and the shadows began to move, thickening, crawling like something alive. I could hear them slithering across the wooden beams above me. And then there was a sound I'll never forget. A deep, resonant creak coming from the very walls, like the house itself was shifting, groaning under some hidden weight. I reached for the door. My hand, trembling, grabbed the handle and yanked it open. But just as I did, I heard a voice, a real voice, coming from somewhere above me. No, no, don't go. He'll never let you leave. I spun around. The boy was gone. The attic felt empty, but not empty in a normal way. More like the space had been filled with something else. The cold was gone. The weight on the air had lifted. But I knew better. I turned, almost stumbling down the stairs, my heart slamming against my ribs. When I reached the bottom of the stairs, I slammed the attic door shut, but the chill never left my skin. That night I lay in bed, wide awake. I couldn't stop thinking about the boy. I heard the creaking of the house, the scratching of nails against the wood, like something was moving in the walls again. And I realized something. The boy never left. He was still there in the attic, watching, waiting. And no matter how far I ran, no matter how many doors I closed, I could never truly escape. The next morning, my parents told me they had found an old journal in the attic. It was a child's journal, the boy who had lived there, the one who had never left. His last entry? They said I would never leave, but they were wrong. I'll wait for them, I'll wait for whoever comes next, and when they do, I'll show them the way. They asked me about the journal, about the boy, but I didn't tell them the truth. I couldn't, I wouldn't, because I knew. The boy in the attic? He's still there. He's still waiting. And if you ever hear scratching in the walls, if the air turns too cold, if you find a door you didn't notice before, don't open it, because he's watching. And once he sees you, once he knows you've come too far, he'll make sure you never leave. Please don't forget to like and subscribe for more scary content.